Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is David Hitchin, and I'm the BSI Product Scheme Manager for ISO 44001. I shall talk for about 30 minutes or th 30 to 40 minutes about uh, the developments of 44,000 and uh, some of the detail uh, regarding the standard. So my talk is broken into a number of parts. Firstly, a brief overview of formal collaborative business relationships. Secondly, the ISO high level structure, which ISO 44,000 uh, complies to, which will be an introduction for some people and a reminder for others. Thirdly, uh, I shall spend, and I'll spend most of the time on this, the development of ISO 44001 and say some key points in the evolution of collaborative working to a management system standard and changes from BS 11,000 11, part one. Finally, I shall summarize the steps to certification as a new client or making the transition from certification to BS 11,000 part one. So we step back in history, uh, partnering has been the focus uh, for parts of the UK Ministry of Defence back in 1998 with a specific aim to identify value to all partners in business relationships. This value may be uh, reduced cost, reduced time, better efficiency or cross mitigation of risks in the business relationships. The MOD part Partnering Handbook was published, uh, as indicated, in 1998 and was developed to enable delivery of projects within increasing capital constraints. Development of the handbook into a publicly available specification, PASS 11000, uh, which was published in 2006, provided a common structure and a neutral starting point for all types of businesses uh, in general to collaborate together. Due to keen business interest and key support of the Institute of Collaborative Working, the recognized industry body in this area at the end of 2009, a decision was made to form a standards committee and upgrade the PASS, the publicly available specification, to an auditable British standard, which became BS 11000 Part 1. Part 1 was published as a framework in 2010, and Part 2, a... Um, supporting guidance note was published in the following year, 2011. Now let's just look at uh, some of the structure of the existing standard because it is relevant to what we're going to talk about when we come on to ISO 44001. The structure of BS 11001 reflects the established and recognized eight-stage collaborative business relationship principles formulated through the Institute of Collaborative Working, as illustrated on this slide. The structure of the standard is built around a life cycle of collaborative relationships comprising of these eight phases split into three distinct stages. The process begins at the point of an organization first recognizing that it needs a, a relationship to, uh, a, to help enable achieve its objectives and generate value and the, the, the steps that it must go through to uh, shape and qualify its own expectations even before partnership selection begins. The structure then supports the process of identifying potential partners and the need and considerations involved in making the relationship work. A particular emphasis on recognizing value creation and ensuring this remains central as the relationship continues. The exit strategy on here, while it appears at the end of the process, actually begins its life much earlier during the knowledge stage it may seem a little unusual to consider this before even beginning a relationship, but even the most successful partnerships should have a predefined exit strategy. This is done to ensure the best possible outcome for all parties, including ownership of any joint know-how, and to leave doors open for potential future relationships where appropriate. Continuing in the vein that we were talking about earlier, in practice, collaborative relationships often evolve as an evolution of conventional transactional relationships between organizations, starting at the working together stage, and require a certain amount of retrofitting or re-verification of earlier steps to meet the requirements. We shall see how these principles fit in with ISO 44000 a little bit later, but uh, let us first look at uh, the, uh, the history of the development of uh, 44,001. So um, the development of the standards uh, takes a um, 
fairly um, standard course in ISO methodology. In September 2013, um, the Technical Committee uh, made a resolution 104 2013 to approve a project committee to formulate this ISO standard because of uh, interest internationally. Uh, in February 2014, uh, the um, committee was formed, PC 286, and in um, the following um, couple of years, uh, the standard was uh, drafted, formulated, and uh, debated, resulting in a uh, DIS, that's a draft international standard, uh, DIS 11000 being published in January 2016. The DIS allowed um, the uh, public scrutiny of the draft for other interested parties to um, uh, to comment uh, on the standard and to ensure good buy-in uh, in um, uh, the the resulting standard that came out at the end. Uh, so um, on uh, in March 2016, the UK uh, Standards Mirror Committee uh, made an invitation for public comment uh, uh, until 21st of March. 2016, and these were incorporated and considered by uh, the committee in May 2016 uh, when they re reconvened for a meeting in Milan uh, with the advised changes, both from interested parties, practitioners, auditors, and indeed ISO. Uh, in September 2016, an amended draft was available uh, um, to the committee with no significant technical changes identified. And this signaled that there was no need to um, redistribute standard into the public domain or issue a new DIS or FDIS. And the standard uh, following uh, certain editorial changes was published on the 2nd of March 2017. Now let's look at uh, ISO 44000 and uh, its relation to the high level structure. Now in my introduction I said that um, uh, this was uh, a reminder to some and an introduction to others. So I will uh, spend a little bit of time on this. The, the high-level structure, or perhaps more formally called ISO 2012 high-level structure, uh, provides a common standard framework for management systems requirement standards. So auditable standards that um, um, uh, are uh, generated uh, for different aspects of uh, process controls, uh, generally follow a plan, do, check, act cycle. And these have been uh, increasingly aligned to conform to the ISO high-level structure, primarily uh, for interoperability. So the master structure allows uh, quality uh, management systems environmental management systems, and other systems that um, conform to this, standard, so this uh, structure to be um, more closely um, uh, aligned and avoid duplication in, uh, in governance and in management. So in the high-level structure, clauses four to seven are associated with the plan part of the plan, do, check, act cycle. So those in summary are clause four, which is context of the organization. So this is the horizon scanning and looking to where the organization um, exists and its key issues. Um, clause five uh, is, uh, covers leadership and the commitment from the top. Clause six covers planning, and that's both risk mitigation planning opportunity identification and realization, and the formulation of uh, business objectives. Clause 7 covers support, which is the, um, uh, the things that the organization needs to, uh, the resources to support the um, operation of the management system. And the uh, focus of operations in Clause 8, so that reflects the do part of the plan, do, check, act cycle. Clause 9 covers check, which is the uh, performance evaluation, and clause 10, act, which is, uh, covers um, improvement uh, to the management system. So if we build up the picture here, the context of the organization here uh, for ISO 44000 includes um, the standard areas uh, covered in the high-level structure, understanding the organization in this context, 
the needs and expectations of stakeholders, so the consultation far and wide regarding the, their relevant issues, and a specific area for um, collaborative working, which is um, the creation of value. Clearly, uh, the, the key motivation for establishing and maintaining a uh, collaborative business relationship is the identification and creation of value that wouldn't otherwise exist within transactional relationships. And the conventional part of high-level structure is determining the scope of the management system, in this case, of course, your collaborative business relationship. Moving on to leadership. Um, leadership covers uh, commitment uh, of the top management, definition of organizational roles and um, uh, their authorities. And in collaborative business, the governance structure and the the, um, senior executive responsible. So the um, uh, clause five hardwires the requirements of a, a senior executive re uh, responsible uh, to the operation of the management system. And this is a key area where top management can define and influence the culture within an organization, which is an important aspect to uh, successful collaborative working and successful um, compliance and effectiveness to ISO 44001. Moving on, we have uh, actions to address risks and opportunities for the system. So again, this is looking at um, uh, risk mitigation and opportunity realization on the biggest canvas. So um, opportunities to collaborate and opportunities to um, uh, mitigate risks to the organizations through collaboration uh, at the highest level. This forms a basis to form uh, organizational objectives and then um, of course plans to achieve those objectives. Uh, one of the things to secure the realization of objectives is top management signing up to plans to achieve them. So if you have a plan to achieve your objectives which is supported by uh, top management then clearly there's more uh, opportunity uh, to realize those objectives rather than um, leave them to chance. One specific area here that's additional to uh, collaborative business relationships is the identification and prioritization of collaborative relationships. Again, before um, engagement, then there is a wide horizon scan to look at potential uh, partners. Moving on. I mentioned support, which is uh, really the resources and the ability to deliver the management system. Um, there are conventional uh, high-level structure requirements, uh, the provision of resources overall, which tends to be from the uh, top management, uh, collaborative business uh, competence, and specifically behaviors. So the success of collaborative business uh, generally you know, it depends on trust, and those trusts are manifest in um, management and staff behaviors. So this is highlighted in this uh, support activity. Conventionally, in high-level structures, the awareness, uh, communication vehicles, defining information requirements for the system, and uh, documentation, documented information control um, are conventional aspects of management systems that most people will be familiar with. One specific area is the um, uh, the inclusion of um, documented information to cover competencies and the uh, CRMP, the um, Relationship Ma Management Plan or the Corporate Relationship Management Plan, which is mandated to be uh, documented information. We move on. Operations is the doing of the doing. Um, and this contains the key elements of operational planning and delivery and maps uh, approximately to the um, ICW eight-stage process. So, um, and which are covered in BS 11,000 clauses three to 10. So there are some differences, which I'll come on to a little bit later, but uh, at the top level, the, the main doing of the doing is in clause eight. Moving on, um, performance evaluation is uh, from a high level structure uh, point of view, uh, standard fair where the organization is obliged to define monitoring, measuring, analysis, and evaluation uh, requirements and um, processes uh, to um, 
to evaluate the performance of the management system. There's conventional requirements for internal audit and for uh, a management review activity. Now, as a reminder, management review doesn't have to be one meeting once a year. It could be a combination of meetings or combination of activities to cover the mandatory requirements in Clause 9. One very specific activity is exit evaluation. So the uh, ISO 44001 standard does mandate a formal exit evaluation um, uh, as far as um, part of the Plan Do Check Act uh, cycle is concerned. And this is important to ensure that the exit is done effectively, so perhaps an, a, a new uh, collaboration can form or that the, uh, the stability in a conventional um, uh, business relationship after the exit of collaboration. Uh, and indeed, there are key learnings so that uh, a you know, collective partner can then establish new relationships with uh, learnings from old relationships. Um, and then finally, on this uh, diagram, uh, the um, improvement. Um, again, for those uh, familiar with um, uh, management systems, ISO and BS management systems uh, requirements, then improvement conventionally covers uh, the identification recording of non-conformity, uh, the determination of root causes uh, for those non-conformities, and both corrections and corrective actions to prevent those non-conformities recurring. And then a general catch-all for continual improvement. So despite all those formalities, the last one in, in all the HLS-framed um, uh, uh, management systems is opportunities from continual improvement should be identified and plugged back into the system to continually improve the management system. Okay, so that's quite a, a heavy slide. Uh, what I'd like to do is to look into a little bit more detail um, uh, and uh, take those components apart. Now, if um, uh, the audience doesn't uh, uh, recognize these all in one go, then this webinar will be recorded so you can replay parts uh, for your uh, for additional understanding. So, context of the organization, we've, uh, we've uh, mentioned this additional creation uh, of value. Um, one of the key points that I'd like to, uh, to, to raise here is that um, in identifying the context of the organization and the requirements, uh, there's a wide, wide relay, uh, range of collaborative partners that organizations may need to uh, to recognize, to establish to align objectives. And I call this casting the net wide. So organizations are invited to cast the net wide in identifying uh, perhaps uh, less familiar partners uh, that, um, uh, that they're used to working with and recognize whether there is a, a collaborative profiles that would uh, be useful to explore to realize uh, a more fruitful um, uh, collaborative relationship. And when I say fruitful, it's driven by value creation. The key driver here is if those collaborative relationships drive extra value uh, that wouldn't be realized by a conventional contract or conventional transactional relationship. The next bit, leadership, I've uh, mentioned already. Um, the additional requirements for governance structure and the uh, uh, identification of a senior executive responsible. There are enhanced requirements for top management to demonstrate governance and to take authority for ensuring the management system works. So historically, uh, this uh, activity can be delegated so that the responsibility is delegated to middle management who don't have the authority or resources to realize the management system. And the high level structure, and ISO 44001 that corresponds to this high level structure, has taken the opportunity to hardwire top management into their responsibilities and commitment. So I look at this as top management are hardwired in to ensure uh, as much as possible success of the delivery of the management system. Moving on, planning. Um, this is uh, um, uh, now known as um, actions to address risks and opportunities, and in this case for the collaborative business relationship system. So um, this is looking at both sides of the coin of uh, risks and opportunities. And the context of this, because it's in planning, is before anything's happened. So this is very much um, an instinctive uh, responsibility of senior management and indeed the executive of the board. 
uh, to Horizon Scan to look at the organization's risks uh, and to mitigate them and to look at their strategic opportunities and to look at realizing them and balancing those two things off and often they go in pairs. The context of this, of course, is for collaborative relationships. That framework then uh, provides a, a place to um, set system objectives and as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, underneath that, plans to achieve those objectives. So objectives are not just uh, agreed and plucked in the air and thrown to the, uh, the, the organization and then reviewed a year later to see if the organization has met them. Um, there need to be plans uh, to ensure that the resources available and mobilized to make those objectives realizable. So the emphasis on risk management and proactive mitigation and prioritization of um, collaborative business relationships. Finally, in this part, um, support. Uh, I've mentioned support of the uh, resources to realize the, uh, uh, the, the management system activity. So um, competence and behavior are particularly highlighted here. So it's not just competence, which is familiar in other management systems. That competence needs to be translated to um, uh, demonstrating trust and and trust can't be audited, it can't be seen, it's, it manifests itself in management uh, uh, behavior and uh, corporate culture. Awareness and communications are standard parts of management systems to make the work and management of information requirements and documented information. And again, as a reminder, um, the documented information needs to include um, documented competences and the corporate a relationship management plan explicitly. Let's we'll move on to the um, second part of the standard, which is clause uh, 8 to 10. So um, the next cut of this is the uh, operations um, uh, focus off on operational planning and control. Um, there's a key area of operational uh, governance uh, which is unique to the collaborative working standard uh, and I'll talk a little bit back about that later. Um, requirements regarding supply chain and ex extended enterprise opportunities and threats. So again this is a little bit of a change from uh, BS 11,000 um, part one where organizations are invited to look at the supply chain or perhaps even you call it the supply network um, not just their immediate suppliers, but their um, second and third tier suppliers, and realize potential um, uh, collaborative opportunities uh, throughout the supply network. There's a need to look at the um, exit strategy um, and um, uh, the, the elements of uh, the existing BS 11,000 part one are reordered and consolidation uh, are detailed level. So we'll talk about, about that a little bit more. Um, these are formalize, formalization of a process-based system. So again, uh, we're looking at convergence between uh, other standards and the high-level structure and the existing BS 11,000 part one. So um, process-based um, philosophy is highlighted in the ISO and um, this introduction of governance requirements within partnerships is um, uh, mandated in Clause 8. There's a larger scope for risk and opportunity assessment in the supply network, which I mentioned earlier, and that builds on, to, uh, on from looking at uh, risk and opportunities in Clause 6 at the system level. One of the interesting uh, improvements, I think, is the um, uh, management of exit strategy, which was concentrated in the latter parts of um, of uh, um, ISO 11000 part one. It's now more generously distributed between different areas of clause eight and indeed clause nine uh, to highlight the importance of, of formulating an exit strategy early on in the formulation of a relationship. Uh, some would call it a, a prenup. So there's more formal controls uh, with the same principles involved. I will talk about this a little bit later. Moving on, uh, performance evaluation, uh, key areas here, here to uh, add to the high-level structure is this formal exit evaluation. And the improvement, uh, this very much reflects the high-level structure as written, so the requirements for, uh, for 
managing non-conformity, corrective action, and continual improvement. Now, let's let's uh, consolidate this to together. Now, this slide uh, uh, illustrates the um, uh, the Russian doll uh, type um, structure of ISO 44000. Um, the outside layer is the system requirements, which cover clauses four to seven and nine to ten. Um, contacts, leadership, planning, support, performance evaluation and improvement, which we've talked about. Then the next doll inside that is the um, operational compliance requirements, uh, which is under clause 8, so 8, 2, 8, 3, 8, 4 and 5. And there are specific collaborative compliance requirements. So the collaborative requirements uh, cannot be done alone. Uh, they, they are covered in clauses uh, 8, 6, 8, 7, 8, 8, and 8, 9. And they can only be planned, realized, uh, and indeed audited um, when an organization is in collaboration with another organization. So the way the standard has been put together um, follows a certain amount of log logic. It starts right at the top and looking at the, the, the existence of the organization, and then it moves through a, a certain amount of logic to uh, realize uh, operational uh, compliance requirements, collaborative requirements, and then uh, evaluation and improvement in the PDCA uh, cycle. Uh, some organizations follow this way of working when they, uh, they establish a management uh, system. But uh, from my experience, um, the, the collaborative relationships uh, evolve in a slightly different way. Um, they evolve from um, organizations that are already working together and they have a certain amount of trust anyway um, as a conventional um, uh, contractual relationship. And they realize that they are able to realize uh, the better uh, uh, value or extract better value from the relationship by formalizing the collaboration. And so they work outwards from this, uh, this area and establish um, uh, the uh, retrofit, the, uh, the partner sele uh, selection requirements, they undergo uh, post-partnership um, uh, post um, um, internal assessment knowledge and awareness. And that's important so that the organizations or the component organizations in the partnership are in a good place to form new partnerships and indeed to review the existing ones they're in. So that's not in the order that the uh, standard is written, but it is often the, the way that the organizations establish their coll collaborative capability and grow outwards from the collaborative relationship. And the two specific concerns relating to this common practice, um, and one of them, and I've mentioned it a few times because of the importance, is the lack of exit strategy preparations. So uh, organizations that have established relationships then inherit a position where they don't have an exit strategy and have to retrofit them. Whereas if you start with a blank sheet of paper and you follow the logic requirements of the standard, then it obliges you to do, to do this early on. And secondly, the possible realization that there are better partnerships available from a different starting point. So that in a, in a practical situation, often that's not something that can be dealt with and often it's a long term strategy to say, well actually uh, we will develop this partnership, we will have a, 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 a lifetime that can realize value and then in the longer term a new partnership may need to be formed to form greater value in the interests of both parties. These aren't barriers for certification, however. Um, but organizations need to be aware of the requirements and demonstrate meeting them even through retrofitting. Now this is looks a bit of a daunting slide and I clicked next before I started to speak which was a bit of a mistake. But in this slide uh, we'll dig into the, um, the next level of detail of operations in clause 8. Now what I've done is to look at the component requirements of clause 8 which across the top follow the um, ICW eight stage process. Uh, awareness, knowledge, internal assessment, partner selection, working together, value creation, staying together, and the exit strategy activation. But in, in reviewing the um, components and where they lie in clause eight, 
they te tend to form streams of activity. And I've uh, suggested a, a simplified way of looking at this in the streams on this slide. So you have the top stream, uh, which I've called uh, the SER stream, which has activity in clause, uh, subclause 8.2, and then later um, in 8.6. So the management of the, uh, of the progress to comply uh, to um, uh, ISO 44000 and the maintenance can follow streams which uh, follow the uh, horizontal um, rows in this slide. So the next one is um, relationship management plan. And again, um, the uh, standard obliges or mandates organizations to consider this uh, right at the beginning uh, awareness and then go through a number of steps uh, to uh, furnish a full joint uh, relationship management plan uh, through the maturing relationship and delivery of it. Governance is uh, covered right at the beginning in awareness and then is revisited in the uh, centre part of this, regarding um, in internal assessment, partnership selection, and working together. The next uh, theme that I've uh, identified, I've uh, grouped a number of things together, objectives, uh, value, and value analysis. Uh, and this is visited in each of these subclause, subclauses. So uh, firstly, there's the identification of those elements, strategy and business case, and we can follow through uh, uh, development objectives, assessing joint objectives, and then value creation and delivery. The next um, uh, strand or theme uh, in um, Buttermilk on here is the competencies and behaviours, which are introduced in awareness and identification of key individuals in uh, uh, Clause 8.3, knowledge, and then looking at uh, improving those organizational collaborative competencies while working together. The last three elements, which I'll briefly cover now, uh, looking at an initial risk assessment and developing a operational risk management process, and then uh, establishing a joint risk management process. So again, there's a natural logic uh, through that theme. Um, Next stream I've called uh, partnership management, so the identification of collaborative business relationships and identification of prioritization, and then uh, defined selection criteria, then nominating partners and then having initial engagement in uh, clause 8.5, and then establishing the uh, agreements and co contracting arrangements within those um, um, uh, partnership management activities. And the, the final theme on here is establishing the um, uh, exit strategy. So this is formulated to start with in clause 8.3, the initial exit strategy, which is done uh, by an organization on itself. Then uh, moving through a joint exit strategy, um, assessing, establishing a joint exit strategy, and maintaining the exit strategy uh, through the lifetime of working together. Uh, and uh, staying together, then uh, the organizations are in a good place to initiate dis uh, disengagement but maintain business continuity uh, in the relationships and then perhaps move to not a total divorce but looking at a more conventional uh, transactional relationship uh, should the uh, circumstances present themselves. So there's quite a lot on that uh, slide, and uh, you, you can refer to it um, after the, uh, the webinar, but um, I'll just highlight each of these themes. The SER theme, the Relationship Management Plan theme, Governance, Value, Objectives and Measures, Competencies and Behaviours, Risk Management, Partnership Management, and exit management. Now what I'd like to do is to move on to um, certification and uh, timeline uh, estimates regarding um, certification uh, to ISO 44001 and existing certification to um, BS 11000 part one. 
So I have got some slide diagram that illustrates uh, the recent history, the publication of the uh, draft international standard, um, the uh, intermediate draft 44001, and then the publication of ISO 44001 uh, in uh, early in March uh, 2017. The number of uh, things that uh, BSI have conventionally done in the transition of uh, certification products and the style of which we're going to manage this is it should be of no surprises. There's no fundamentally different um, areas that we will manage differently to, to, other, to other standards. So BSI's policy is to fully recognize ISO 44001 as the collaborative business relationship standard. As a convention, BSI will support uh, BS 11000 Part 1 certification until two years after this publication of 44001, which will be uh, to March 2019. BSI will continue CAVs or surveillance visits to BS 11000. However, the expiry date of any new certificate, so if there's a recertification in this period, will be March 2019. It will not be the uh, three years from the certification. Now, conventionally, after the launch, after uh, a few months, UCAS um, may um, uh, invite um, a pilot uh, for uh, looking at accreditation to this scheme. Uh, so, all standards are not accredited on launch, and certification is not accredited. However, if there is sufficient interest uh, with um, the certification bodies, then the national accreditation bodies, in this case UCAS for the UK, uh, may offer an accreditation pilot uh, and then uh, BSI will be in a position potentially to offer an accredited certification service sometime in the future, generally a year, 16 months following uh, the uh, publication of um, uh, the standard. Transition. Um, the transition process, we have piloted uh, transitions uh, with a number of organizations and our tra transition process from uh, BS 11000 to ISO 44000 uh, is going to follow this process. And this is additional to the um, surveillance or recertification visits. There will be a, a half a day pre-assessment which can be on or off-site, uh, this is to be agreed between uh, your client manager and um, uh, the client, whichever is uh, most suitable and convenient. Then there's a one day on-site transition assessment to assess the organization's uh, compliance and conformance uh, to the requirements of ISO 44001 and then a half a day report preparation off-site. Uh, so these, uh, this transition process is an additional um, uh, requirement to the conventional program. So specific uh, jobs need to be raised uh, for this uh, two-day transition, uh, which you should discuss with uh, your client manager uh, for the uh, best dates suitable, so they can support you uh, in this. In the medium term, there will not be a, a uh, ISO 44002 guidance document and the existing BS 11000 Part 2, uh, the existing guidance, is currently being planned to be revised to form a guidance standard to, to support ISO 44001. A full suite of BSI training, training will be available and details are available on the BSI website. So uh, we had some um, pre-webinar questions which I, we had a look at beforehand and uh, I've put them up here. Hopefully we've answered them all uh, in one way or another and some duplicates in there. Um, so um, I've checked through and I think I've uh, answered them all. But if anyone's got any other questions, then please, please um, uh, ask, ask them uh, at the end of this presentation. One of the things uh, that we have recognized uh, are a couple of editorial issues in the publication of um, uh, 44001. So one is in clause 8324. If uh, uh, the more diligent of you um, uh, study that, you'll re realize there are no requirements in it. Um, and I, um, it needs to be treated as guidance. Um, there may be future debate whether there can 
should be a should, which makes it mandatory, but we have to use the standard as it is written. We can't interpret it in the way we think it is. So 8324 uh, is guidance. Similarly, uh, clause 8610, the final paragraph, doesn't have the S word in there, so there's, there's no short or. Um, so again, uh, that needs to be recognized as uh, guidance. And finally, um, the, the useful um, structure in uh, um, uh, clauses 8x1 uh, uh, are illustrative. So they illustrate the, um, the logic regarding the, uh, the processes, but um, they're not auditable directly in the diagram. Um, the substantive text underneath them are the areas that are uh, auditable. Okay, now thank you very much, uh, David. Um, what we're going to do right now is to open the panel out to questions. The questions are, following the launch of ISO 44001, has there been any certifications to the standard? Uh, yes, Rob. The, um, uh, there have been uh, six or seven um, uh, pilot organizations. Uh, six, sorry, I've just counted them up. Uh, have undergone transition assessments and have been certified by BSI uh, following the launch of the standards. Um, in the public domain, they are uh, Costain, uh, MCOR UK, uh, Kia Construction, Lidos, uh, NATS, and Network Rail. And these are the first six uh, UK, and indeed uh, uh, for our understanding, worldwide companies to be independently assessed uh, uh, to achieve certification to ISO 44001. Thanks. Okay, the next question is, will there be internal auditor and implementation training available from BSI? Uh, yes, Rob, there the, the, uh, will be a training available. I, I mentioned it just very briefly in my presentation. There will be uh, training available for uh, requirements and migration to, to ISO 44001, uh, implementing um, ISO 44001 uh, collab collaborative business relationships. Um, 44001 uh, internal auditor course, um, collaborative leaders course, uh, and senior management briefing. Uh, and if uh, any of the um, webinar participants would like to uh, Google UK training courses, uh, uh, then they'll be able to find more detail uh, on these courses offered by BSI. Here we have a question which has come in from an email, and that was, um, has there been a template gap analysis which is created for clients moving into the transition phase? So, for example, the current scope of work versus a new scope of work, where are the differences, and do we have any access to templates? That's, that's a very good question. We found, uh, or BSI have found, in transitions for other standards that uh, having uh, a template is a really useful tool for organizations to identify and recognize where they are on the transition journey. Um, the template, there, there is a template available and we've uh, validated it through the pilots with the organizations that have got the first set of certifications and they will be available to you through your client manager so you can request them uh, to uh, identify where you are on that journey. Okay, the next question is, will BS 11,000 be withdrawn from the 31st of the 3rd this year? And therefore, if certification is still in place until the expiry, does that mean that we should continue with internal uh, slash external audits conducted to BS 11,000 until the transition phase? And uh, any new clients, therefore, just starting the journey will need to start the ISO program as well? Yeah, there are a number of points in there that um, in the two-year transition um, uh, uh, time, uh, any existing uh, BS 11,001 certifications will be respected and uh, we will continue to do surveillance and recertification visits during those two years. However, any new certificates um, will have an expiry date um, uh, in March 2019. The, uh, it's up to clients to discuss uh, with uh, their client managers, and indeed uh, it 
it refers to the previous query um, using that um, um, transition template to understand where they are on that transition journey and uh, plan uh, a transition assessment over the next two years um, and then recertification to the new standard. So in, June, in uh, March 2019, all existing um, BS 11,000 uh, um, part one certifications will expire. So uh, there's two years for organizations to consider when and how to plan their transitions to the new ISO 44,000 standard. BSI can help you at every step. Uh, so we've got a question which has come through which asks what requirements uh, or specifications are set out to measure competency in collaboration while mentioning this was missing in BS 11,000? Um, that's, that's a good question um, and uh, competency uh, uniquely in collaboration is a combination of technical skills and also behavioral skills. Um, the thought leadership in the, this area is driven uh, through the agents of the uh, Institute of Collaborative Working and uh, some good work has been uh, progressed by them uh, in identifying the key traits involved uh, in uh, establishing trust and also conveying the trust which is not auditable uh, or uh, not observable directly into the types of behaviours that um, uh, managers and staff um, uh, how they conduct themselves um, to uh, realize uh, the, the, uh, the collaborations. Um, and sometimes uh, during my time looking at uh, clients, it's, it's a bit like um, uh, an elephant. You can't, it's difficult to describe, but when you see it, you recognize it. Um, the way that uh, organizations from different, uh, different sides of the park work together, one of the key um, signals for good collaboration is if the, uh, the partnership um, management structure is peppered with the best person from the job from either each of the organizations. So you don't have the senior layers of the management dominated by one organization, for example, a client, um, and the junior organizations by the service provider. If, if uh, an organization has people uh, from uh, who have different skill sets and different um, uh, experiences and they're peppered uh, throughout the management uh, structure, then that is a signal that the, that collaboration is working well because the, the collaborating partners have selected the, the best person for the job, whichever organization that they come from. So our next question is, how does ISO 44001 and its documented systems tie in with ISO 9001 quality management? That, that's, that's a good question. Um, uh, the, the way that I'll answer it is, is looking at that, that high-level structure. The, the, the high-level structure has been um, designed to uh, help organizations have compatible um, management systems. Uh, is one way of looking at it. So uh, compatible quality management systems, environmental management systems, health and safety, uh, occupational health and safety management systems, etc. And in this case, collaborative working management systems. Um, but another way of looking at it is uh, there are separate management systems. Ideally, these should converge and you should have a business management system, the rules for running a business and the, the, the boundaries really between the quality elements and the environmental elements and in this case collaborative working elements should be blurred. The high level structure allows an organization to, to um, um, or mandates them to uh, look at fundamental concepts for uh, establishing their management systems, the scoping them and delivering them Okay, and some of those factors are common, for example, between, in this case, from the question, 9,000 and collaborative working. So if we look at clause four, we've got um, uh, uh, the context of the organization. So look in the context of the organization, in ISO 9,000, you look at the uh, interested parties and their relevant issues regarding quality. 
so that might be uh, uh, connected with uh, the quality of raw materials, the quality of um, processes uh, that an organization um, deals with, and the quality of product to or service to the uh, to the client. Um, that overlaps with uh, collaborative working. So if you have uh, a collaborative partner who is a um, client, then um, there are things in, uh, that need to be recognized as far as um, the context uh, and the issues that the, the client has as far as quality as well as um, realizing that quality through a collaborative partnership. And you can look at that for other standards as well. So you could look at um, uh, uh, environmental impacts or health and safety impacts, but that's for another conversation. So our next question is, my company has BS 11,000 recertification visit diarised in 2017. Will we still be given 18 months for a transition? Yes. Yes, you, uh, you'll, have eight, uh, you'll have two years from the 3rd of March. And whether you have recertification or not, um, the, your transition journey uh, can be defined by yourself. So as long as it's completed uh, for March 2019, then you can um, uh, establish that work with your client manager uh, with the template for uh, transition to understand where you are, where you need to develop your systems, and then you should be in a, a confident position to um, to undertake a formal transition assessment and be recertified to the new standard. And looking at the uh, the transition template, it will be self-evident, uh, and also with discussions with your client manager, whether there's more work to be done. So you can say, well, we'll have the recertification of the old standard, and we'll plan to to enhance or develop these new processes over the next five, six months, or ten months, and then put them into place and have the transition. Um, uh, assessment at a time of, uh, uh, of your choosing. Okay, so we have another question which is, when is BSI going to start the ISO 44001 certification process for organizations? Well, we've already uh, started it. Um, we have undertaken the pilot, which we mentioned earlier, and um, uh, six UK organizations have been successfully certified to ISO 44000. This is a very important process uh, for us to validate um, our certification service. So um, we are in a very confident position uh, to offer uh, competent um, uh, uh, auditing and certification to the market. Uh, another question is, can the half-day assessment be included in a scheduled visit? Our starting position is no. Uh, we, and and this, uh, doing these pilots, uh, we had a number of uh, uh, opinions of the, the best and most efficient and value-added way of doing these, uh, these um, uh, transition assessments. And we, the consensus decision that we needed two days and the best way of structuring it to, to minimize inconvenience is the way that I've illustrated. Now, those can be um, connected to a uh, surveillance visit for operational convenience, but they can't really overlap because they're two, doing two, two different things. One of them, uh, your surveillance visit for 11,000 is looking at compliance and effectiveness of the current standard and the transition assessment is looking whether the organization has developed the wherewithal and the um, compliance requir conformance requirements to, to the new standard. The next question is, would you advise of any tools to identify and track competencies and behaviors? Um, yeah, yes, I would. I mean, one of the fonts of information, again, is the recognized industry body. Um, and uh, I'll go back to the point I said earlier that uh, the success of collaborative working depends very much on the culture uh, of the and behaviors within those partnerships. And those are in, underpinned by trust. So the key thing is uh, being able to establish trust which is, which you can't um, observe directly, and an auditor who's certified can't um, uh, can't audit. What they can observe and audit is uh, behaviours, 
and behaviours uh, can be by witnessing uh, an active um, uh, partnership and the meetings within those partnerships, but also um, the documentation uh, and the uh, interviews with staff and uh, particularly the senior management, but all people in, within the partnership can reveal whether those um, uh, behaviours are apparent. Now, um, development of those behaviours is something that um, um, BSI have insight in and can talk about uh, in the, um, the training courses, but um, the ICW uh, have a great um, a wealth of information and access to resources to help organisations um, uh, develop uh, the attitudes, the trust and the behaviours to make collaborative working successful. So thank you very much, David. We do have a few more questions, but I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there because um, it seems that we've overrun by a few minutes. With that in mind, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you very much, David, for uh, your time and also your expertise on the subject. And thank you. And uh, for all of those with questions, if you have any other burning questions that you really need to ask, um, please don't hesitate to drop us an email. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.